There's no music without sound, and there's no sound without vibration in the air. When we want to listen to a piece of music, we must first create vibrations in the air, create sound waves that hit our ears and set our eardrums vibrating. Maybe we can skip this process by simply thinking about a piece of music and hearing it in our heads. But then we're really neither listening nor hearing. And that would be a pretty sad world, wouldn't it? Simply living in our heads. We could think about music that we know, sure, and we could try to imagine new sounds and new musics. That internal processing is itself a very important part of music making. But without hearing, we would be cut off from the vast world of music that exists outside of ourselves. Music from other people, other cultures, other worlds communicated to us through the complex language of sound. And anyway, no one begins life with music in their heads. We are sponges, constantly listening, constantly hearing, constantly thinking about, interpreting, and feeling the music that we hear. The difference between a sound image in our head and actually hearing a sound is that the sound needs to exist in the air for us to hear it. We can create sound waves in the air the way people have done for millennia, by hitting something with a stick, plucking a string, or simply making a sound with our mouth. In the 20th century, we developed a brand new way of making sound using electronics. In fact, it's safe to say that no development in music has ever been as profound as that of electronics, giving us the ability to record sound onto tape, the ability to project sound using speakers, and the ability to generate completely new sounds using a synthesizer. The simplest way we can generate a sound using electronics is to use some kind of circuit to vibrate a speaker cone back and forward. If that speaker cone vibrates at a constant rate, it'll generate a single tone, which vibrates the air around it, hits our ear, and sets our eardrum vibrating. On the synthesizer is the oscillator, and it's the basic bed of tone that all the other circuits of the synthesizer shape. There are typically a handful of controls on the synthesizer that affect the pitch of the oscillators, since this is one of the most important properties of the sound that we create. We've already seen how the keyboard sends a precise voltage to the oscillators to tune it to a semitone. We also have a tune control for fine tuning, so we can tune our synthesizer together with a friend. Further, we have octave switches for the oscillators, that allow us to switch between octaves. Our oscillator oscillates around its zero volt reference point where the speaker is at rest and moves between two values. Let's call them positive five and negative five volts. It swings from positive five volts down to negative and back up in its very specific time, this time or the period of the wave determines its frequency or pitch. There are lots of different paths our oscillator can take when vibrating between positive five and negative five volts. The most obvious is a straight line from positive five all the way down to negative five and then immediately jumping back to positive five volts. This is called a sawtooth wave and it sounds like this. It's a useful wave shape because this immediate jump from negative five to positive five volts creates a lot of harmonics. But what are harmonics? We've seen how the rate of oscillation determines the frequency of a sound or its pitch, and we've seen how the amplitude of an oscillation determines its loudness. But the shape of the oscillation is a very important feature in determining the timbre of a sound. 
A guitar and a saxophone can play the same note, and it's their timbre that allows us to distinguish those two instruments apart. When we pluck a string, we of course hear a note at the pitch or frequency determined by the length of that string. But we also hear a bunch of other frequencies above that frequency. These are the harmonics. The string actually vibrates at many different frequencies simultaneously, all of which are determined by the length of the string. The most prominent is the fundamental frequency, the lowest possible frequency that can fit onto this string, and it's what our ear uses to determine the fundamental pitch of our note. But all the other frequencies that the string vibrates at, which are harmonic multiples of that fundamental, are at lower amplitudes and give the sound its color or its timbre. With an electronic instrument, we can choose a wave shape directly. Typically, we have access to simple geometric shapes, one that are easy for an electronic circuit to generate. The simplest wave shape is that of a sine wave, which has one single frequency at the fundamental and no harmonic overtones. It even resembles our vibrating string with no harmonics on top of it. After the sine wave, we have the triangle wave, which is similar to the sine wave, but loses its rounded crests in favor of these pointed turnarounds. The triangle wave has a little more harmonic content than the sine wave, but is still mostly fundamental frequency. Sines and triangles are great shapes to use when you want a mellow tone with low amounts of harmonics. They're also great for adding harmonics on too later on, via distortion, wave folding, and modulation, all of which we will touch on in a later lesson in this class. Running a triangle through a filter, however, won't result in a very interesting sound because it just doesn't have very many harmonics for a filter to grab onto. What about the sawtooth wave we looked at earlier? Well, it kind of looks like a triangle, but then instead of coming back up the way it came down, it instantly jumps from bottom to top, creating this discontinuity, which in turn creates a lot of harmonics and a characteristically buzzy sound. What if we want another waveform full of harmonics? Maybe it would make sense to take this instant jumping discontinuity of the sawtooth wave and copy it. If we simply jump immediately from top to bottom, over and over, then we get another waveform that's traditionally used with lots and lots of harmonic content, in this case called the square wave. The square wave is a symmetric specialized case of the more general pulse wave. It doesn't matter when in the period of the wave the transition from top to bottom happens. It just matters that this pattern repeats at the frequency of the pitch of our note. We don't need to understand everything about shapes and harmonics in order to play a synthesizer, but it's good to gain some familiarity with the basic shapes and why they sound the way they do. Sharp corners and sudden discontinuities create a lot of harmonics, whereas smoother waves create far less. Think about plucking a string. When we pull a string back in the middle, before we release it, it starts to look a bit like a sine wave, and when we release the string, we get one tone. Whereas if we pluck a string near the bridge, pulling that string back, the shape looks a bit like a sawtooth, and when we release it, we get a buzzier sound. This is why we typically use sawtooth waves when we're synthesizing string sounds. Exactly understanding the nature of harmonics isn't terribly important when playing a synthesizer. You as a musician, as a listener, are better served by just turning knobs and turning switches until you stumble upon a sound that you like. But having some familiarity with the basic shapes can give you a bit of extra inspiration when designing sounds. The most important takeaway from this series is to use your ears and trust them. If you like a sound, it doesn't matter how you got there. All the synthesizer programming experience in the world will never replace 
the sheer joy and enthusiasm of someone eager to explore. No lesson is more important than this. Have fun, open your ears, and listen. Layering two oscillators together can greatly expand our sound design possibilities. The mixer allows us to combine two signals. If I raise the level of oscillator two, we start to hear both oscillators simultaneously. Since they're both at the same frequency and same shape, adding these two oscillators together doesn't initially seem to do very much. But what happens if we change the frequency of oscillator two to be ever so slightly off from oscillator one? Then we begin to perceive the phenomena of interference. Both oscillators are at slightly different frequencies, and when they coincide, they reinforce each other. But when the positive part of the oscillator overlaps with the negative part of another oscillator, they destroy each other in what's called destructive interference. This gives us a distinctive beating or phasing sound. This detuning thickens up a sound and creates the sensation of a chorus of oscillators, making a sound feel much more vibrant and alive. We can detune oscillator two even further to a perfect fifth to create an interval that moves in parallel across the keyboard. We can use the octave switches to increase our range. Some synthesizers even contain a sub-oscillator, which follows one of the oscillators, in this case oscillator one, but always at one octave below, allowing us to mix in extra bass content. Oscillators are the main sound sources on a synthesizer, but most include an additional circuit because of its wide range and flexibility. This is the noise generator. Whereas an oscillator produces a pitched sound, the noise generator produces an unpitched sound by random fluctuations. Imagine the speaker cone moving randomly back and forth, back and forth. White noise is in fact a broadband signal that contains all frequencies within it. We can use it to create sounds like the snare under a snare drum. Or the sibilance of an S sound or the sound of wind on a blustery winter's night. Or the sound of the cosmos. Did you know that when you listen to an analog radio, or perhaps when you used to watch television through an antenna, that while your radio or television is trying to lock on to a signal, it's always picking up noise from somewhere. This noise is the symphony of all the other radio stations transmitting. It's the sound of all of the electromagnetic waves that surround us at all times. It's the sound of atmospheric disturbances. And a little bit, just a tiny bit, but always there, is the sound of the Big Bang, traveling to us from the edge of the universe and the edge of time itself.